How has your mindset about getting paid a premium? How has that changed since you have been a part of the Well-Paid Musician program? I think before Well-Paid Musician that, you know, I was going by what bars and restaurants pay. And I thought that that's, that's just what musicians make. Mm-hmm. And they're doing this unless they're a big time star. But being a part of the program, well, first of all, I had a little hint, like I knew that there were people getting paid more than me, but I just didn't really understand why. Mm-hmm. And um, then in the program, just that I'm so glad you like started off hot with it like this. I'm like, OK, changing my prices to that, like immediately. And then to my surprise, people were just for private events were like, OK. Like, oh, OK. All right. Awesome. So this is the Well-Paid Musician Success Series. And uh, the point of this is uh, for our members who have been around for at least a year to kind of showcase (laughs) not only their results, but their own unique process to how they run their business and how they've approached this program and the kind of the philosophy and the uh, process that we teach here. Um, I'm really excited today because we have Kim from Kentucky. Funny thing, Kim, I was going through some old materials and I, when I first spoke to you, I was selling this program over the phone and I have the recording of us talking from like, I think it was like right before the pandemic. So uh, I remember that. Yeah. And uh, (laughs) at that, it was when you were like, I'm confused because I thought I turned this page off. Your program was actually referred to me by like from another program that I was in. And she was like, hey, you're a musician. He's a musician. I think you guys, I think you should guys should talk. Yeah, that's that. I I heard that back in the recording. That is so cool. So uh, (laughs) awesome. So thank you for taking the time to do this today. Oh, thank you for having me. Absolutely. I'm really excited. (laughs) Um, So just tell us a little bit about what you do. Hey, well, um, I do solo and duo gigs. I when I'm doing solo show, well, I guess for both of them, really, I use a loop pedal. So the way I present it to people now is I explain, imagine if Ed Sheeran was a girl with a keyboard and an Afro poof. That's what I do. And um, that seems to clear up some of people's confusion when I present it that way, because a lot of people have seen Ed Sheeran live. A lot of other people in Well Paid Musician are also looping artists. So um, I think you all will probably probably understand that. And when I hear Ed Sheeran, I just think like pop music. It is a lot of pop. Um, I do have to clarify that I do a lot of a lot of different styles because my the bulk of my training was in dueling pianos. Okay. So that so usually me take a lot of requests. You're playing guitar and piano, or just piano. Honestly, it depends on how much space they had. Usually, okay. usually it's piano, okay. and I like using the piano because it has pretty decent drum sounds on it. Okay. So. Um, Usually piano, but I also add guitar. There are some gigs where they just want guitar, um, maybe no loop. They just want something like real super chill. So um, I have a lot of, I have a lot of offerings. I'm actually working on narrowing those down, but it had in the past it has worked to my advantage to be so flexible to be able to switch from piano, guitar, mm. loop, duo. What do y'all want? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> So what are you doing most or like what is the most uh, in demand or, or even lucrative thing that you're doing? Ooh. It's it's split 50-50 for me right now. Um, well, let me kick it back. I would say 2022, it was split even, like right in the middle. It was partially duo and then it was partially me by myself. Okay. 2023, it was mostly me by myself. And... um. And people seem really interested in the, oh, you do like Ed Sheeran does live? That's pretty cool. Because um, it, I guess a lot of how I present myself and how I talk tends to attract other women, mostly women around my age. And um, that's the kind of thing that they tend to be into. Cool. Okay, awesome. So um, I'm just a series of questions that I have that I'm asking everyone, and we probably won't get to all of them, but... Uh... We'll see how this whole thing flows. Um, What do you feel is the most important part of your marketing slash presentation for getting new clients? Video. Video? Okay. Video. Okay. That is, I mean, you could talk about yourself to your blue in the face. You can type about yourself 
but yeah. people want to see what they're going to hire okay. and not to see it, but they want to, they want to hear it. And, um, I'm in the process of updating my current videos because right now they're about two years old or so. So, um, without a doubt, been video. And, um, I also want to get some more really good, clean footage of me performing live because if you're the videos I have right now is just like me and a it's not a studio but kind of like studio esque, so they they want to know what it's going to sound like in a restaurant even though it's the camera mic but either way they just want to see what you're like in front of people and how you interact and what kind of energy you're going to bring to their party. Okay, yeah, so that's a good follow up. Then, like, what do you think makes a good video for a potential customer? Ooh. Uh, you went what, decent, uh, like decent versus audio. Versus what we think as musicians, mm -hmm. right? Like if I'm a pedestrian, I don't play music, I want to hire an act. What do you think I'm looking for in the video? Like what do you think is the most important elements? Um, how your frame and camera, of course you want to be well lit. Like, um, I got one that I thought was going to be a really good video, but it turns out it was super dark and I was, it was like teeth, you know? So want to make sure you're, you're well lit. And uh, whatever you're performing, the aesthetic is clean. Uh, okay. Don't have like a real a messy aesthetic. And uh, don't get me wrong. I also have to get feedback from other people. Like, how do you think I can improve this? Um, how can it look better? But um, I also like to make sure it's not too close. Like, you don't want to be up in someone's nostrils. Like, that's not good. But then you also don't want to be too far. You don't want to be like a little, a little peon either. Like, you want to... It, it should be some, something in between that where they can see you, see your whole body, see how you're carrying yourself, um, or at least, at least torso up, I would say. But um, because there, there are some videos where, you know, you can't really see my, my feet that well. And that's, that's fine. But then, of course, there is also the audio because most on-camera yeah. microphones are not right. that great. So if you can get some kind of external recorder... Mm -hmm. that's going to take your take your video up even more. Um, it happens to be the ones that have gotten me the most bookings. We did use an audio interface. Um, so we had something for my microphone. We had something, we had the guitarist mic mic'd. And he was able to go through and do his mixing magic stuff, which I don't understand. And <laughs> he made it sound a lot better than what it did on camera. Okay, so... Talking about camera angles, lighting, uh, but I think, yeah, clean audio is very important because you want to represent how you sound yeah, uh, the best you can. And especially if there's noisy chatter, that's the worst. Like, that's mm -hmm. worse yeah, don't, than no video. <laughs> don't post those. Yeah, don't, yeah. don't post those. It's not... Okay. Um, well, I mean, well, if you do post those, like, maybe Instagram, but or maybe even an Instagram story. Right, but, you're not going to lead with that type of promo to get private event clients. Uh, right, exactly. Okay. Um, what about, like, dressing the part? Do you, uh, for weddings, like, are you going to wear something more dressed up for a promotional video to approach wedding clients? Like, what do you do? I do have my wedding outfits. Okay. I, I do have my wedding outfits. Um, mine's actually... It's really funny because the one that I have for my videos for weddings and my photos, I should say, is not something I'd actually wear to a wedding because it's white and I don't want to do anything to offend sure. the bride. But right. I do have an alternate brown one. Okay. That is, for me personally, it's a sparkly thing. It's a romper. People are like, oh my God, I love your romper. And or a jumpsuit, whichever one you want to call it. And But it has a little bit of sparkle and pizzazz. I think that most people just want to know that, um, you know, we can show up to bars and restaurants and we can be kind of dressed down a little more casual. Yep. I think they just want to see that you're going to put some effort mm -hmm. into how you look. Right. And because um, I can go from a mom uniform to glam real quick. Real quick. So I try to make sure I put on that glam. When I was a social worker, I would be in different settings. I'd be in school. I'd be at the client's home uh, or like their extracurricular activity or summer camp or something. Mm -hmm. And so there was no dress code. It was just dress as the staff dresses. So if I was in school, 
if the teachers wore jeans, I'd wear jeans. And that's how I approach private events. Like if it's somebody's house, I'm going to wear jeans. I'll pr I always wear mm -hmm. like a collared shirt, but um, I'm going to wear jeans. But obviously I'm not going to do that at a wedding because no one's wearing jeans at a wedding. So uh, that's kind of the way I roll. Like dress as the guests would dress. Uh, if you want to dress nicer, there is no problem. Like you're never going to get uh, in trouble for dressing too nice unless you upstaged the bride you wear you like you're talking about. But, yeah. you know, if you want to err on the side of caution, I would dress nicer. But you don't have to. I just say like dress as the uh, guests would. So. Yeah, that's a. This is a, I don't know if I call it a mentor, but I seem more like a boss at a dueling piano bar. Like we had to this day, we were a little casual at our location because it is a chain of dueling piano bars. But okay. he said to try and dress you. Sh the people in attendance and the audience should not be more fancy or artistic or artistic looking than what you yeah. are. Yeah. And uh, sometimes that's difficult for me because I'm not really that trendy. But I do have a lot of sequins, and so I wear my sequins as much as I can, and that seems to. Plus, I'm I'm kind of um, I'm a very energetic performer, so um, sometimes people aren't really paying attention to what I'm wear wearing, like in that close of detail. They just see sequins, they see a gal on the piano. They're like, oh, look yeah. at that. <laughs> So the theme that I am picking up on is aesthetic. So I asked you like most important part of your marketing, you're saying video and then so aesthetic. And then when you went into the video, you got into specifics like lighting. And then now we're talking about wardrobe. So, um, you know, I, this is for me, I think like uh, a good perspective from a female, you know, and maybe you, you will pay more attention to uh, a, an aesthetic than I would. Uh, like oh. when we first jumped on here, you're like, oh, your background's fake. I'm like, oh, you noticed. I was impressed because I, I, at first I thought it was real and then you moved and I was like, oh, nope, that's not, that's not real. <laughs> um, it, the, I don't know if that's a female thing or if that's just, um, or if it's because, um, before I decided to make, I took a little break from music and I, um, learn how to edit videos for photographers or videos, videos and photos for photographers. Yeah. So that could be something that's feeding into it. Also, another factor was when I started, which from piecing together your timeline, I think was around the same time. Um, you, you know, the, the DIY musician thing, it, it was just kind of, it was right after MySpace and um, being able to create your own websites and now became easy and something that was always, I had these people try to step in, maybe it's because I was a young 20 something and they would just try to take over everything. But I would just be like, look at how you, ugly this is. And so I just, I wanted, I wanted control of that. And um, it's actually a really, really long, a really interesting story that I might share on my Instagram that I think about it. <laughs> and um, so aesthetics has always been something that is important to me in marketing. I should also note that I, also worked at an ad agency and I, my degree is in marketing. Okay. <laughs> so these, these could very well factor into all that for me. Yeah. Well, I think also that just, that sounds like another part of your artistic outlet. Um, and I, I understand that. Like before I played music, I would draw, I would, you know, I love to do visual art. Ironically, my, my aesthetics are not good anymore, but, um, but the fact that, yeah, that was something that you were doing as part of uh, a career and also a creative outlet makes a lot of sense. So that's good. Um, but OK, so, I mean, it's, that makes sense. it's worked in my favor. Yeah. But um, yeah. I don't know if that's. I do think it's important because I, I heard some, some somebody, some training, some course, I don't know, where they said that people come to conclusions or at least like that initial handshake like you have only so many seconds to make that good impression. Yeah. And um, I don't want anybody to be like too critical, especially if they have like a website and you know you're not a graphic designer, you know you're not a web designer. It's I think having that website is what's most important. But if it's like really strong and solid in that presentation, that just gives people more confidence. So 
the aesthetic isn't just for the sake of being vain. It's just for the sake of putting, giving people confidence that you know what you're doing, that you are a professional. And um, yeah, and- it, it's, it's, it's work for me, but other people have ways of establishing or giving people that confidence other than just focusing on their aesthetics. Yeah. I mean, what comes to mind is uh, uh, mental triggers and, you know, something we talk about in the training and uh, an authority, right? So if you have uh, some credibility, like maybe mm-hmm. if, you, if your website is, is garbage or whatever, maybe somebody <laughs> will think, oh, well, this is an amateur, right? And they're going to make mm-hmm. a kind of snap decision. Um, you know, I, what I like to do, and, that, and there's a valid point to that. And so, yes, you want to have your aesthetic to be the best it could be. But really just looking professional because of that reason where people, you know, you need to establish the authority that you are professional, you, you do this for a living, um, and this is your business and mm-hmm. to be taken seriously. Um, but there's definitely other ways to communicate oh, yeah. that as definitely. well. And so yeah. if if your strength is not in aesthetics, like me, I feel like my my personal website is way way overdue for an update and my uh business website for this is like it's okay it just Mm -hmm. it gets the job done it's nothing you're gonna go wow that's like but i rely on other things for authority other than the aesthetic so um yeah but i do think it's a good thing to to bring up and especially if you're if you're strong in that then yes you know use that as a way to establish yourself as a professional yeah, there. Yeah, there. And like you said, like, no, no, hopefully I led or hopefully I did suggest that that that's just something for me. Yeah. A, I don't know if it's a strength or an interest or or yeah. what. And so I am pretty good at being aware of my strengths and my weaknesses. And so I know that that's a strength of mine. Yeah. Now, I know my weakness is ironically being a musician is audio stuff. So I'm going to outsource that to let people fix it and make it better. There you go. And um, so like with the video and making sure it sounds good, like honestly, one of my videos, I posted it and I forgot I hadn't edited the audio. So oh, so somebody went back and fixed it for me. So I, I lead with with what I know I'm strong in the same way when I yeah. perform. I, I know where my strengths are and where my weaknesses are. So I. Well, let's talk about that. Right. What are your strengths okay. for performing? I know that I am pretty good at connecting with the audience and for getting people on my side. Um, if you've ever done that, um, is it Strengths Finder? I know that one of my strengths is command. I'm pretty good at commanding an audience. So I try to lead with that if we're in the type of environment where that is appropriate. If it's something where they just want background music, sure. then I'm going to lead with strong songs that I know are really going to catch the crowd's attention or something that might showcase vocals. Um, yeah, because I can support myself, but if you want me to do something real impressive on the piano, I, I don't know about that. So I'm going to start with something that I know might be um, really impressive to them vocally. Like, um, I like to hold out notes, especially like high things in my chest voice, hold out those notes, extend them. Um, and, uh, or, um, I know that I have, my chest voice can get kind of up there. So I might do something that might be a little oppressive, a little high. Uh, but usually I'll get like those party starters going okay, or pe- things that get people in. So that's how I lead with my strength. I sing over all my weaknesses. <laughs> yeah, but it's important to know. And, you know, we talk about that in the training too, like the SWOT analysis, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And that way, trying to assess your abilities, also asking other people to help you with this because <laughs> it's impossible to be objective about yourself. Um, and then using that to market yourself and, and make, you know, craft a unique selling proposition. So uh, what do you use as a unique selling proposition? What is, how do you sell yourself? Like thinking of your strengths. That that exact thing that I said in the beginning, like, <laughs> you know what Ed Sheeran does live? Well, imagine him as a girl with a keyboard and an Afro poof because of my hair right now it's in twist, but every now it's an Afro poof. So they know that it's kind of poppy. I think I was at first saying that I was soulful acoustic music with a modern twist or something like that. But, mm. um, and that worked. That was fine. And 
who knows, I might switch back to it because it, it is, it's true. Yeah. And and it's, it's true. It was acoustic music with a little, they wanted a little bit of soul. They wanted something that could go either direction, that it could be good pop, that it could be um, Aretha Franklin, whichever yeah. one you wanted it to be. But when I see videos that you post on Instagram, it oh. seems like it's like always a dance party. Yeah, that is, oh. that is a, right now, just for my personal, just, I had, I've had success, I would say, a successful music career, um, especially as a solo person um, doing it on my own. But yeah. just for some own personal things, like I have taken a, a job that's not the same, I'm going to stay in it because um, the hours are kind of killing me, to be honest. But I do love the party atmosphere that comes with being at a dueling piano bar. So I'm super okay. energetic. And that's that's mostly what I'm posting on Instagram at the moment. It'll okay. likely be shifting slowly over the next year or so. Yeah. Um, as I get more footage from the private parties where we're really getting yeah. into it. Okay. But yeah, like you said, it is it's a party. It's that's my yeah, thing. We, but I, I think bring the party. <laughs> and and I and I love that because you know, when there's things that you lack in yourself you, you look to other people that are doing them and you're envious so like i i'm not like the party guy when i play music so i love to see somebody like you that can do that command a crowd um i can command a crowd but in a different way um where you're like all right you know let's let's get the party going uh i'll take your requests you know you're gonna i'm gonna get your butt on the dance floor i know the tunes you know it's like that kind of the go yeah um i i would i would call my style and say it's kind of aggressive yeah hey you know it's, what it, but it's fun and it works you know yeah, yeah. It, it works it also works for that dueling piano session uh yeah uh situations i guess or scene um now there are some scenes like where that's not appropriate such as one of my sure. repeat clients is a farm here in town and they just kind of have a, a laid-back relaxed chill they want the that's my kind want, of gig <laughs> yeah uh, they in fact uh they want they usually want to split their gig because it's it's like the same series. So they want acoustic guitar in one spot and then move to another spot. And they just want like the whole pop keyboard. Yeah. Um, a little soulful. If I can throw in a little bit of hip hop feel to it, they kind of are like just like a chill thing. Mm -hmm. They they really love that. So um, okay. I'm not so aggressive there. <laughs> well, I mean, you know how to be dynamic and what's appropriate. And that op opens you up to more opportunities. So, I yeah, like that. It, it's good to be good to be versatile. Like, but yeah. I, I let people, I do let people know. I think it's somewhere on my about page that you know I'm a self proclaimed party starter. So that's so great. when their guests are ready to kick it up, then cool. Now I will say that some people have um, been like, I don't know, I think it's a little too much for what we're looking for for this. And um, yeah, I respect that. I, initially, I might be kind of mad, but. I do, I do That's, respect like, well, I I would rather be partying than not. So, okay. <laughs> yeah. But that's an opportunity to let them know that you also do chill stuff. And like, I don't have yeah. to start the party. Uh, you know, I do, I'm, I'm a versatile musician. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> well, now that we're talking about it, maybe that's something I should start showing a little bit more of in my videos. <laughs> well, that's what showing I recommend. More chill stuff. Yeah. Uh, it's just a range, you know, uh, because there's so many different types of events you know it's not one size fits all and but if you want to double down on the party thing there's nothing wrong with that i'm sure you get plenty of work doing that too um so it's just a matter of you know what you want to focus on but in that uh thought process i did want to ask you about like how are you finding clients how how do you get clients and it's kind of two-sided like new ones and then how do you get um repeat business and referrals so start with the new the new clients how do you how do you find most of my new clients are finding me through one of the paid lead services okay. so something like gig salad or the bash but i'm not sure what it is about me but maybe other people experience this too but a lot of my clients will find me on there and then google me and contact me through my website um I think either 
I think sometimes they're under the impression that they have to pay. Mm-hmm. If they, they contact me, I think that might be one factor. Or um, especially it's for like the big corporate clients, if it's an agent, then they know I have to pay. And so they even tell me like, hey, I don't want you to have to pay their fees. So I'm contacting you directly. So, so you have booking agents contact you that way too. Yeah, yeah I, absolutely. It's so, so weird because I have nothing on my personal website that mentions private events. And I have agents that contact me all the time. And I'm like, you you have seen me on a paid lead platform and that's why you're contacting me. Um, and they're like, oh yeah. So yeah, so that's so you have people that'll find you and and contact you through your own website, including booking agents. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just thinking about yours and I'm pretty sure if you Google your name, because I think I was like, who is this dude at first? It comes yeah. up that you're one of the voices heard on the voice. So I'm, I oh, think okay. that any booking agent's going to be like, he did something for NBC. I bet he knows how to work with booking agents. That's just my, that's my thought process. I could be <laughs> very, very wrong about I, that. I just, I, if the price matches, I'll, I'll do it. But often it doesn't. <laughs> I, I quote too high or whatever, um, which is fine with me because I like doing my own thing. So, so you feel that, um, the new clients are coming in through lead platforms, which is great. You know, you're, you have this kind of omnipresence and people are also contacting you directly, which is cool. Um, do you ever find like, I find it annoying uh, Instagram DMs because I don't see them uh, mm-hmm. in that, like if the, if the person, if you're not following them, if there's not mm-hmm. like a mutual follow, it doesn't go to your inbox a lot of the times. Right, right. And uh, I don't really check my, my, personal uh instagram very often i check the well-paid musician one mm. uh regularly so uh, i'm i'll miss those dms do you do you find do you get dms about gigs i do on occasion um honestly a lot of my most of my dms have been hey i just sent you an email okay um, every now and then like uh, i just got one i guess about two weeks ago that was somebody saying hey we saw you at a wedding um, but I think they thought that I was, I don't think they realized that wedding paid as much for me as they did. <laughs> okay. So once I quoted them, I think they were just like, and I'm going to disappear. <laughs> that happens. It happens to the best of us. Oh, it happens to everybody. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I didn't take it personally. I was just like, you know, I would other, that's a busy week. Um, in case anybody's watching this, they don't know it's Derby. This is where the Kentucky Derby is. Yeah. And they were contacting me during, I have like three gigs in a row. So I was like, I'm going to do it. It has yeah. to be this much because I'm going to be yes. tired. And they didn't want to do that. So I don't blame that's them. The, you know what? That's a great place to be in. Uh, you're in demand and you know what, not only what you, you say, like worth, but you understand what the current market is paying you, the, the clients that you have right now. So why mm-hmm. would you do it for less, especially knowing that you're going to get a gig, get a busy season or busy time like that? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, this is, yeah. They don't, don't want to sell yourself short on that particular week. Now, if it had been the next week, eh, we might have a little bit of wiggle room. But that particular week, no, sorry, it's it's firm. <laughs> so um, I want to ask you about referrals and repeat. But oh yeah, I'm sorry. That's what, I what, you, about what that you just said brings up a point. What yeah, what is your pricing? Not specific numbers, but how do you handle? You just said like wiggle room, busy and slow seasons. So do you negotiate on prices? Do you have a, I mean, how, how does it work for you? I negotiate on prices if I know they're going to, like uh, that farm I mentioned, it's actually, it's actually like three clients in one okay. um, because there's three different businesses who are working as a part of it. Okay. I know that they're going to keep booking me mm-hmm. for those. So I might give them a lower rate because I know that there's three of them is going to amount to this much. Um, but otherwise, otherwise, um, my pricing right now is based on it has to be worth me taking my time off at the Dueling Piano Bar because we get tips there. So I get my shift pay and then we get tips so I just kind of worked out what the averages and I'm like, okay, yeah. for it to be worth my time to take yeah. off to do this gig, mm-hmm. I need to make sure I'm going to make at least this much. And at that, I also follow profit first. So it's got to be double that. And um, because I pay myself 
Okay. So um, that's that's what's worked well for me, <laughs> and uh, at least what what works for me and what makes things worth my time. But if I was in a place like, um, say, I, I quit the bar, and um, and I also feel like a bar this bar is different than like doing your traditional bar bar gig where you come and set your own stuff up. Like everything's already there for me. I just walk in. Well, anyway. and also just to interject because you know somebody be like, well, why are you playing in a bar? Yeah. Um. You know, recently talked to another dueler in this group, and they're not making three hundred bucks. They're making sometimes eight, twelve hundred dollars with tips. Yeah. You know, walking <laughs> up like so. It, it's not. It's not a two hundred and fifty dollar bar gig. Even if right. the base pay <laughs> might be that, like the tips are going to be could be like four times as much as the base pay. So, so there's a reason. Um, if you're doing that kind of thing, yeah, I mean, that yeah, pays, that pays like a private event. Exactly. That's, that's, um, it's like doing a few private gigs events in a row every week. So, um, yeah. by the way, if there's anybody in this area and we're, we're looking for trainees, just so you know, um, how far are you just beside, how far are you from Nashville? About three hours. Yeah. Okay. Um, in 2021, I drove down for a corporate event and, uh, cause, cause I didn't so want to fly at that point. And um, I so brought, far, I brought my P. I know, but I brought my PA, and I did other things while I was there. So we <laughs> drove through Kentucky on the way back. Um, so I was just thinking, if I ever do a road trip like that again, I will have to hit you up and see where you're <laughs> I, I, I love that. Uh, yeah, that's that's a lot of fun. And um, I actually went to school in Nashville, oh, or okay. college in Nashville. So um, it's it's very different, very very different. Yeah. Than um um. I might not be fooling some people, but I might be a little bit older than some of y'all think. So, so it was very different when I was in college, and um, I barely recognize the city now. But that's a lot of fun. Okay. The next time, don't sneak through here without telling me, Matt. All right. Well, I might be down this summer, um, but I'm definitely flying. I don't blame, I don't <laughs> yeah. blame you at all. Yeah, it was just like right, it was like the first gig, at, first live gig, pretty much like after well in the pandemic and mm -hmm. uh plus i needed well i didn't need to because i i've i did that gig like two years before or no the year before it was like the weekend that they shut everything down like i was flying mm -hmm. home um mm -hmm. so i rented the gear down there but this time around i don't know it just it was a different experience i felt like eh, take a road trip do it a little differently but uh i digress i digress i would what i um i wanted to get back to the referral and repeat business so um New leads, new or new customers finding you online. How are you getting referrals and repeat business? And are you doing anything proactively to get those? Um, most of my referrals might come from like that. Um, the one person who's like really singing along the most in the background that maybe you didn't even notice, and they will be like, "Hey, what's your Instagram?" and usually go from there. Honestly, that's most of my referrals. Um, I did have one venue. The staff has changed now, but I did have one venue that would send people my way. Um, I do feel like I, that's something I need to work on as my referral network. But more, almost every show I do leads to more shows. Somebody there wants to okay find out about you. When how so. do you continue the conversation? Mine is real simple. It's a it's a QR code. It's a QR code that links to um, how to contact me. They can add me as a contact on their phone. Um, they can email me. They most of them most of them will follow me on Instagram, and then um, they'll usually they don't DM me. Usually they might think of me and then go to my website from my Instagram. Okay. Um, that's that's most referrals. Um, otherwise. Sometimes I get stories from people, they're at a wedding and they'll actually contact the couple and the couple will give them the information. Um, I wish there was, I should streamline it a little bit more, but honestly, I'm kind of, that's, I need to go back and re refresh myself on my follow-up after the gig. If yeah. I should give them an incentive, like, Andy, I'll give you a free coffee or something. <laughs> well, um, that, yeah, that's why I asked some people have the specific follow-up process um the first interview that i did um in this series 
uh, Cam said that he texts the client after every gig. That's a uh, great idea. Is just thanks, a, Cam. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Cam. Okay. That is a wonderful idea because usually mine is an email. And especially if they're weddings, it might be on a honeymoon or it may have been like this as ad just specifically for that wedding. That's yeah. so common. And so then once the wedding's done, they may not check it. So um, that's a great idea, Cam. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start doing that. <laughs> yeah, just a thank you. Um, a thank you. And I, I also send them a survey. Um, oh, okay, cool. What, how do you, what do you use for survey? I use Typeform. Okay. Um, I might... I might start using my current CRM since it has that ability, but I okay. I feel like sending them to Typeform, it looks a little cleaner, looks a little better. Cool. Um, and it fe feels more official and less, uh, I better watch what I say because she's really reading this. But anyway, <laughs> I can take things that they say from there and then be like, okay, well, that's how they found me. Maybe I should work that up a little bit more. Like I okay, found so out from, I'm sorry. This, okay, this is a process. I want to hear more about this. So you, you send an email with a survey after every private event gig. Yeah. That's awesome. Okay. How many, what's the percentage of people that fill it out? <laughs> it's not that great. I would say about okay. 25%. Okay. Especially corporate. Corporate people are probably the worst about not filling them out. Okay. Um, you well, know, they're spending that, somebody else's money. Does that coincide with a review? Um, the, yes. Like, yes. I'll be like, hey, um, especially if I was talking to them a lot um, during the actual event, um, or like really making sure, I want to say schmooze because I want to make sure you're like being authentic when you connect with them. Yeah, absolutely. But um, then I just, I tell them, hey, after this, I'm going to be sending you something and it's really going to help me get my business off the ground, even though I've been in business for a long time. <laughs> being, get my business off the ground or to book more gigs. Do you mind taking the time to, to fill that out when you see it? And they're like, oh yeah, whatever you want. Absolutely. For the ones that, Sometimes like when I wasn't that, um, maybe like I got distracted or I was trying to pack up, we had to be up by a certain time. I didn't get to make that connection. I find that those are the ones that are less likely to answer those surveys. Okay. So survey versus review. What what do you get oh. more of? To get more reviews? The people who write reviews also fill out the survey. Okay. It's in the same email. That's okay. why. Okay. Um. So with the survey, are you getting any critiques that are constructive criticism versus a review is going to be praise? I, I, unless you messed up something, like you're not going to have some be like, well, you know, she could have improved on this. They're going to be like, she was awesome, five stars. Or, you know. Actually, I, I did have a few that gave me some. In The reviews in, actually were the, the ones that gave me more more feedback. Really? Um, yeah, I know. It's kind of surprising. There, It was a private party um, a little outside of the city, and it was a real simple thing. She just wished that I had a speaker both on the outside where she had me and on the inside. Like, oh, okay. well, that would have been an easy fix if I'd known before. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> and um, yeah. Um, and then another one, it was like a college or university. Um, actually, I tried the, I think, they they ended up giving me four stars and I was trying to follow up on why, but I honestly think it was because I got caught in a traffic jam on my way there. So I was just, mm. I think I made the whole gig start late. So embarrassed. <laughs> well, really super reason, embarrassed. Yeah. Um, what I typically find is it's all or nothing. Mm. Uh, there was a gig. It was, this was, I'll keep this story brief. Um, my wife was like super pregnant and, uh, there's just a lot going on, and I left the house without my guitar. Oh, my gosh. And I had, like, a two-and-a-half-hour drive in about an hour, and I realized I didn't have it, so I called the client and said, hey, look, I'm probably not going to be late. Just want to let you know. Like, I'm yeah. going to stop and rent something. And um, she hung up on me, and then she emailed me in all caps, so screaming. <laughs> I get to the gig. I'm running, you know, I'm like freaking out. Uh, it turns out she had the wrong time and I was actually like uh, an hour early. Oh my gosh. So everything was fine, but <laughs> she did not leave a review. Um, and we did not work together again. <laughs> so, just, so this is one of those where, and it took her like uh, 
took her a couple of weeks to give me the balance, which really was, you know, again, this was about eight years ago, but, uh, I was worried cause I was just kind of building my online reputation. I was like, I'm going to uh -huh. get a bad review. I think that people, if you, if anything like that happens and sometimes yeah. they do, like I think what I see is like either just won't review you yeah, or if, or, or if you did a good job, they're going to give you five stars. And yeah. So, yeah, it's most most people who don't like you are just as I've had. I mean, I've had my bomb of <laughs> of shows too, and uh, they just they just don't re leave a review. Yeah, but yeah. for anybody out there who's just getting started and concerned about the review, don't yeah, yeah. don't fret because sometimes yeah. people just get busy and they don't write a review. Like, how many times have you bought something and say, "Hey, can you follow up? Tell us about your experience." And you've been like, eh. "Exactly." Hey. Um, and it's not that you didn't enjoy the experience or that the staff that was there wasn't great. It's just that you got a lot of things on your plate and you just need you just need to get through your day, not stop and write a review. So don't discourage if you're not getting them, yeah. but also don't freak out if you get there and it's awful. So unless you don't show up completely like high and they're not stoners or completely <laughs> drunk, they're yeah. probably not going to give you a, a bad review. And but if they do. um I was just talking about this with uh, uh, Pat Kelly because we're talking about content and things. Uh, one of the ideas was, you know, how do you respond to negative reviews? And I think that the way to do it is to, to not ignore it because pretty much any place that a person can leave it a, a review, the vendor can respond to that review. So hmm. you want to respond to it. You don't want to ignore it. And then you just want to address the concern of the client in the most neutral, professional, diplomatic way you can. And so if you were late, you say, I I'm really sorry. I know traffic is an excuse, is not an excuse. And thank you for the business and whatever it is. Um, if they're doing something unreasonable, because I, I did see this one on Wedding Wire where it was like, uh, they left it, they left a really nasty review for this band and the reason is because the power kept going out, but it was in the, when the person responded, it was like, look, you know, it was in the contract that we ha would have to have this type of, you know, dedicated circuit, this amp, you know, you, you signed off on this and that was not our fault. So I'm sorry mm -hmm. that this happened. But so when I read that response, I was like, oh, this, yeah, this is not the band's fault. This is the client's fault for ignoring mm -hmm. that entire part of the contract. And if that client, if that band didn't respond, I would have thought, oh man, they, they, they screwed up, you know? So it's just like anything, you're, you're doing it, you're responding for the other potential clients that are going to read through your reviews, because they will, mm -hmm. just like on social media, reading through the comments, uh, everyone does it, and mm -hmm. your potential clients are going to read through all your reviews. Well, they're going to read, th they're going to look for the negative reviews and the mm -hmm. positive reviews. Because you, it's easy to filter worst first, yeah. and so if you respond, and you go, oh, okay, all right, well, that's an understandable situation. This is this is a human being that makes mistakes, but I only saw that happen once. Like, okay, mm. like we can we can move past this. This is not someone that uh, I should write off. Hopefully, reviews have been around long enough too that we, as the potential client or potential customers, know how to decipher somebody who's just being a little too difficult versus somebody who's who's not. Exactly. I also want to say that that one lady who gave me the four stars who wish I had an extra speaker, she's come to two more like public events that I've done. So we good. And she's and she's referred me to business as well. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. So uh, that four star review was not the end of the world. <laughs> no. And so and I think sometimes people think four star is like the best they can leave or they think that's a great review. So the, the, those things happen. Yeah. Yeah. Some people never give five stars. It doesn't matter. It could be, yeah. it could be the best experience they've ever had in their whole life, but I don't know. They just, I mean, that's what I go for on Amazon is I look for the four stars because I think they're being honest. Mm -hmm. And um, usually most of the four stars are like, this is a great product. I love it. I'm like, okay. Yeah. Why'd you give it four stars? Because right. They just don't give anything four stars or five stars. Yeah. Yeah. And it's really important. And I've been having this conversation a lot lately, how important reviews are to the customer journey, especially if they haven't seen you live. 
right? Uh, or, or they don't know you, they're going to rely on your reviews. Um, but the point here is that, because you brought this up like about stressing about it, I can specifically remember starting out, you know, just doing private events, being very stressed at pretty much everyone, wor worrying about that five-star review. Mm -hmm. And guys, that does not serve you, don't do that. Like just do your thing, be professional, and it will be fine. It'll and have fun. Yeah. Yeah. Have fun and have, they'll have fun. Have yeah, fun. Doing, yeah. Fun, fun is contagious. So have fun. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. So we covered a lot of stuff. There are the last two questions that I did want to get to. So um, and then also for me, as I mentioned earlier, following profit first, where I know whatever I charge, I'm taking half of that to immediately put into my bank account. The rest of it's going towards businessy things. So um, and, you, and you, you've said that a couple of times, profit first. You're referring to a book, correct? Yes. Do you want to yes. mention that book? Um, honestly, I'm lazy and I always get like the quick quick notes on this book. But basically, it's thinking about the what are the prices that you're charging and thinking about the success of, yes, your wallet, but also your business. Because how many times, I mean, I made this mistake out of college where I was doing contract work, whether it was music or it was an internship or what. And I didn't know I was supposed to put back for taxes. I didn't know that there were things I need to pay for within my business. Mm -hmm. So this goes, it gets you in that mindset of, I have to run other things too, and I need to pay myself. Mm -hmm. So I start out with, okay, I need to make this to match what my, what, what I would make if I was going to the bar that night mm -hmm. or around about that, or maybe more of, mm -hmm. but then I also know that I have this much in my business expenses. So I need to set aside some money for that. And I know I'm going to get taxed at the end of the year, and I don't want that to be a big surprise. So mm -hmm. let's set aside some for taxes too. And and um, I, I I I don't know. I I have a local Commonwealth here that lets you put them all aside in different accounts, so I don't touch them. But at the same time, my debit card doesn't work half the time. <laughs> so so I might just the tracking. Yeah. But this is a book that you're talking about because I've listened to the audio book. Um, it's mm -hmm. called Profit First, and it's essentially like like buckets uh, i guess the way he mm -hmm. described it was his mom used to take cash and she would have like 12 different envelopes and like each em like this was you know mm -hmm. for the holidays and this was for this and this is for taxes and and that way you kind of forget about that money and yeah. this is a whole separate conversation but anyway if you, yeah. if anyone's interested in checking out profit first it's a book uh, about I, finance it's about i think to personal finance first of all finding out that you don't have to settle for what bars and restaurants charge you if it's something low um that you can charge a premium, especially because they're private gigs and that's a luxury yeah. service. If you think about it, mm -hmm. it's not just a, not everybody can afford a musician, so you can charge a pre premium for it. And then also if you look at it as, okay, whatever I charge them, I'm going to take half of that and put it in my pocket to buy things. Then that'll completely alter, <laughs> the least it did for me, completely altered how I thought about my pricing. Like, nope, this is firm. Sorry, okay. I can't come down on this. So your mindset changed when you joined the program because you saw the recommendations in the training. Uh, you saw it was possible what other people were charging. Yep. And then uh, you got the real world feedback. People were like, yeah, well, that sounds good. And then, then now you're talking about this profit first kind of mentality where, you know, you need to make more money in order mm -hmm. to, to do make these things work. So, yeah. um, okay. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot to that and I think that's great. I think that's why like, uh, you know, having the community of our peers and, and seeing, you know, what other people are doing is, is great too. Um, so that, that is awesome. Uh, my last question is basically, you know, advice for anyone who's making that transition out of the bar scene into higher paying private event gigs like what's, no, it's, what's the most important thing like what's the one piece of advice you would give i would say if you're transitioning out from bars and restaurants you've done the hard work like that's the hardest part mm. you, you, you've done it oh it's just the other little tweaks and it's gonna be it doesn't have to be like all at once but just the little tweaks will eventually get you those higher paying private gigs and the difference is 
night and day. <laughs> like there's really no comparison like of the, the private gigs versus the versus the how draining those traditional bar restaurant gigs can be. So you mean done the work like you have refined the act. You've got yeah. that part you, down. You figured out what songs yeah. that people respond to. You yeah. have you've learned to set up your equipment. You have um you probably have a good system for this is going to sound so weird. You probably have a good system for how you wrap your cables. Like <laughs> you've, you've streamlined it. You know how long it's going to take you to set up. Um, you know how to interact with people. Um, that's the hardest part. Yeah. Yeah. That's such a good point. And it's exact, exactly why I don't tell people how to perform. That's not what well-paid musicians is about. It's about how to take what you do and just market it better so that you can get paid better. And it's like, you don't have to change who you are or what you do. I mean, you will, as you start to see what works better, mm -hmm. just like you would in the bar, you, you learn new songs, right? You do yeah. things that people respond to. So you'll do that for private events, but, um, yeah, you don't have to play weddings if you don't want to play wedding, you know, you could do your thing and what works like. I get this a lot. Well, I don't know how to do the dance band stuff. Neither do I. I mean, like, yeah, I have a band <laughs> that can do it. And it that's fine. And those are fun too. But, you know, uh, it doesn't matter. You just find your niche, you know, and do what you do. You Like Kim said, you already put in the hard work. You've done the hard part. Mm -hmm. Now just use those little tweaks, which is going to be your marketing, your presentation. And mm -hmm. that's what's going to make the difference in getting you paid. And then when you get there, it is night and day. It is so much like, you know, leaving the bar after four hours, getting home at three in the morning with 250 bucks versus getting home at 10 o'clock with 1200 bucks. I mean, it's, it is. Yeah. Night and, day. <laughs> and you nice. did the same amount of work, maybe a little less, maybe you only played three hours. Oh, who knows? Like sometimes. There's a wedding I have coming up that I charge them like the full rate and travel. Yeah. And I'm doing like three songs and I'm like, oh. really? That's awesome. <laughs> well, it seems like I, I I do have, I have to learn like all of those songs. I don't know yeah. them, but um, I thought I was doing more. And then I was reviewing the timeline and the schedule. I was like, I'm not doing like anything at this wedding. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I'm for this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. So um, that is great advice. You've already done the hard work. Just make some tweaks and yeah. it'll get you big results. Um, awesome. So, uh, yeah, I think we pretty much covered the topics that I wanted to discuss. But uh, you've been a member of this community for a number of years now. And I value you, you because you are still active. Um, a lot of people, they join, they kind of get what they need. And then I don't hear from them again, which is okay. Mm -hmm. Um, but there are a few like core members like yourself that uh, are always available to help other, uh, members and, you know, give feedback and advice. So I appreciate you, Kim. Thank um, you. <laughs> thank you for being you. Thank you for, uh, being here today. And if there's anything else that you want to say before we wrap up? Um, uh, everybody go follow me. Kim sing songs. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Not, uh, posted in the, um, it's in the group. Uh, I'm I'm actually joking. I couldn't care less if y'all follow me on on Instagram or not. Um, unless unless you're gonna hire me for a nice event. <laughs> nah, just just joking. Um, I, I'm really too busy with my kids to pay attention to my Instagram most of the time. But, awesome. Um, well, thanks again, Kim. Um, yep, this will wind up in the training portal as a case study on how you do things. Yeah. Oh, I, I'm a party starter. I'm in. I like that. <laughs> Always full of energy. That's a good USP. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Matt. Still learning from Matt. Always be open to that criticism. That's that's something I would say. Always be open to that criticism, that feedback. Okay. Yeah. Don't take it personally. <laughs> yeah. As much as you can. Try to try to not take it personally. Yeah. It's easier said than done, but it, it does benefit you if you can take yes. it in. So. Awesome. All right. Well, thanks again, Kim. Thank you. And I will see you. I'll see you in the Facebook group. All right. See you in the Facebook group. All right. Thanks. <laughs>